I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight for fun food trends from the decades. Um, I usually do these live at the library and Bloomingdale is my home library. So I was excited to do this program this evening. Um, if you enjoy my programs, I will be back on November 16th for Vintage Holiday Cookies and Candies. So if you want to know why ribbon candy is so hard to find and, you know, how candy canes are made or some of the favorite older trends in holiday candy that would be a good program for you to attend and i will also have recipes for that one i know christina emailed recipes out for this one if you didn't get them feel free to email me my email will be at the end or her um, but let's go ahead and talk about it so this first picture is of uh jello obviously and some people call this uh, cathedral window cake or broken glass cake it's got a number of different names um, and it was in my mother's joys of jello when I was younger, and this would be in the, um, let's just say a few decades ago. And I was fascinated with it, and especially with the pie on the top. Um, it was made with uh, black cherry jello whipped with Cool Whip. That's what the filling is. And then you have to make, you know, a ridiculous number of pans of really shallow jello, which is like an inch high. Um, and then cut it into cubes, and then you put it in the filling, and then you line the whole thing with ladyfingers. Uh, and I was just fascinated with this. So I, I put all that work, and I made all three versions of these, and they were quite good, but uh, notice I still don't make them anymore. If you're new to my programs, I like to discuss past food trends. I have 2,000 vintage cookbooks. Many of them are in pamphlet form. Um, my favorites are the mid-century, but they go back to the settlement cookbook. And I have plenty of modern ones also. You'll also find me at like local library book sales and things, picking up more. Um, I had a blog for 13 years where I do make fun of some of the old trends in vintage cookbooks, but it's in a fun, nostalgic way. See, I make fun of this, but I remember it was delicious and how accomplished I felt when I made it. Still not doing it now. All right, so what, how I got into this, I do a, quite a few of these programs a year. I am a librarian and a professor at a local college, uh, local to Bloomingdale, and I write books. I write mysteries with recipes and uh, light romance with recipes. And I got into giving these talks because I realized how many people had good memories attached to certain foods. Uh, and I say that my grandma Alessio, who's on the right there, um, and that photo is from 1995 at my wedding, which was 25 years ago last week, uh, there she is, taught me that bad foods are still good memories. Um, those of you who have been to my programs before know that uh, she turned 90 uh, five or six times, or she turned 89. She just didn't want to turn 90. And at 96 or whatever, she had to have lived to 97 or 98. Yes, absolutely, as a librarian, I could find out exactly how old, but it's a fun family story. So we, none of us try to think about exactly how old she was. So she was still trying to make her Italian gravy in her spotless apartment when she couldn't see anything. I don't know what was in that gravy at that point, but it was terrible um, and it didn't matter. You know, my brother and sister and I were just, Tickled that she was still trying to make it for us uh, at that age. So we have a nice memory of her doing that in the apartment. On the left is my grandma Curtin, uh, who made a lot of her clothes and um, made most things from scratch. They both did, and neither of them wrote much down. I have a handful of handwritten recipes from Grandma Curtin, my cousins and I do. Um, it's things like a uh, fruit cake or I have a recipe, a handwritten recipe from her for beef brisket for 50. I don't, <laughs> and then there's a recipe for Irish coffee that would peel paint. It has so much alcohol in it. And then there's like three different Kolatsky recipes. So she clearly had her priorities in order, but neither of them wrote things down. And so when I would go through and look through cookbooks, I would have memories about what things that they made. Oop, I'm going the wrong way. There we go. Let's go back to the 1920s and talk about what foods were popular. Um, so Americans were being asked to cut back on wheat, meat, sugar, and fat. Uh, we know that World War II, there were many countries going hungry. People were rationing. People were doing substitutions. And there are many trends that are popular today that actually came out of that era. And here is from Foods That Will Win the War. Um, I found this on an electric... Uh, an ebook from the University of Michigan collect has a whole database of 
cookbooks that have been scanned in. And so wheatless day menus, meatless day. Uh, and some of these look pretty good. I don't know about that luncheon on the right that has Welsh rare bits on a meatless day. But you know, some of these were names for things that were substituted too. Some of those look like a lot of work. That's kind of interesting to see what people did. And certainly people at home made a big difference in what they weren't eating and were able to save and help other countries and help the soldiers. <laughs> By the end of this, I will master the arrows. Okay. So here's another ad from World War II, stop waste. And it gives you some areas in which you can stop waste. And these are things that we can still stop waste in today, of course. I don't know how many of us are throwing away our sour milk and buttermilk. <laughs> I usually have to make it if I have a recipe that needs anything for it. The greatest crime in Christendom is not murder, as we might think it is, but it is wasting food. Now, we know that that's facetious, but the United States Food Administration wanted people to stop wasting food because there was such a need at that time. And so then we have the Liberty Sandwich, and I'm sorry that's a little blurred. That was, I was trying to make it a little bigger. So marshmallow cream, one of the two main ingredients in a fluffernutter, was invented in the early 20th century. A man named Archibald Query invented a creation called Mar Marshmallow Cream in Massachusetts in 1917. And there were some other people that created it at the same time. Uh, and you'll find this a lot with various recipes. We'll talk about this with brownies in a few minutes. And so some people named Amory and Emma Curtis of Melrose, Massachusetts invented snowflake marshmallow cream in 1913. So the taste was popular and people would build on it and develop their own recipes. Um, well, Emma Curtis came up with what she called the Liberty Sandwich during World War I. It was peanut butter and marshmallow cream on oat or barley bread, and it was in a little promotional booklet. It may be the real origin of the fluffer nutter. Uh, but then, you know, Archibald Query, because of the sugar shortages, was having a lot of trouble selling his version of marshmallow cream. And so then he sold his recipe in 1920 to Durkee and Mower, two men, and they still have it uh, to this day. They are the makers of the marshmallow cream, and they claim that they invented the fluffer nutter, but uh, that is not necessarily the case. So fluffer nutter is now a tra tra registered trademark of Durkee Mower. Uh, even though the company's U.S. trademark registrations usually cover only ice cream and printed recipes. In 2006, Durkee Mower sued Williams and Sonoma for that they infringed on their trademark by selling a marshmallow and peanut butter chocolate covered candy under the Fluffer Nutter name. Who knew that the Fluffer Nutter would be so contentious? When's the last time you've eaten a Fluffer Nutter? If we look at the 20s in the home cookbooks, I'm in some of the like Better Homes and Gardens cookbooks. Um, we see that some of the recipes attributed to the 1920s are kind of ridiculous. And this one is flapper pudding. And it said, so easy, even a flapper could make it. <laughs> you know what? This is not easy. I laugh about that. But it has eight egg whites. And, you know, you can't like have a loud bang or somebody stepping hard around the oven or it would be immediately flat and so that could never be done in this house. In the 1920s people were having less time for baking as people were trying to find ways to keep their households going during the depression. So we see some kind of convenience foods that are still popular today actually came out of that time. Graham crackers came out in 1925, uh, Wheaties 1924, um, Good Humor is 1926, along with Milk Duds, Lenders Bagels, 1927. 1928 had Progresso brand foods, Rice Krispies, Knee High, Velveeta, that was a big year, right? For nothing healthy. And 7-Up came in 1929. So we start to see some convenience foods. But we also see where some popular food trends began. This is really when brownies were invented. Now, there's some dispute about this. It's like the fluffer nutter. So the Palmer House says they invented brownies in 1892. Uh, and then it first appeared in the 1897 Sears Roebuck catalog. And then there was a recipe for banger brownies from the Boston Daily Globe in 1905, where somebody says they were making cake and forgot the baking powder and got like chewy brownies. 
So all these people were kind of experimenting and came out with it around the same time. They became widely popular in the 1920s. And so there's a bunch of different types of brownies. You may not have known this. <laughs> so there's fudgy, and I found this on, where is this from? foodhistory.org. So the chocolate brownies have butter, sugar, chocolate, eggs, and flour, but the fudgy ones, which many people say are the true traditional ones, have a minimum of flour and no leavening such as baking powder at all. Now the cake-like ones are a little fluffier, as you'd imagine from the name. They have less butter and more flour, and they do have a little bit of baking powder. The chewy brownies get their texture from an extra egg or two and a combination. And then the blondies, which are my favorites, the butterscotch bars made from brown sugar, butter, and eggs. It'll be interesting to see what baking trends come out of this era with so many people baking bread things. Have any of you been making things while you've been at home during the pandemic? Let's talk about 1922 with the Girl Scout cookies wouldn't be safe for that girl to go around like that now with her basket. And we know they're usually sold um, on tables with at least one adult and a few kids selling them outside of businesses a lot of times now, or their people have signups at their workplace. But the Girl Scout cookies had the earliest beginnings um, in the ovens of our girl members. This is from their website with moms volunteering as technical advisors or dads, I'm assuming. The sale of cookies as a way to finance troop activities began as early as 1917. Uh, and then the official start was the Mistletoe Troop in Muscogee, Oklahoma, baked cookies and sold them in its high school cafeteria as a service project in July 1922. The magazine from the Girl Scout National Headquarters featured an article from a local director in Chicago with a cookie recipe that was given to the council's 2000 Girl Scouts. She estimated the approximate cost of ingredients for six to seven dozen to be 26 to 36 cents. Um, you can buy what, like 12 now for five bucks, 12 cookies. I don't know what their profit is. So they were started as the simple sugar cookies and here you have it. And it was uh, suggested they be sold door to door 25 to 35 cents. I can't imagine making six to seven dozen of anything right now. It's the 1930s. We move even closer to instant baking with more shortcuts. So candy bars are still going strong with the introduction of Snickers, Mars bars, Kit Kats, and Rolos. But since the depression, people are heading back to the kitchen. Like recent times, people are going back to baking. So We'll talk about the history of the Toll House cookies, which were invented during this time period. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wakefield purchased the Toll House, uh, which was a place for travelers to stop, eat, and rest while changing horses in 1930. And Mrs. experimented. She cut up Nestle semi-sweet chocolate bars into bits in her buddy, butter cookie and called them Toll House cookies. They became so popular. Other things that were popular during this time were one egg cakes and pies, which surprisingly comes up again during the 1970s, which I'll talk about. The Ritz cracker was invented in the 1900s, but during this era, we see it as mock apple pie. And every time I give one of these talks, people say, I love mock apple pie. It tastes just like apples. I can't imagine it. I have yet to make it. Some people at my shows have told me that the cheese crackers are even better. So. Basically, you take Ritz crackers, you grind them up with water, sugar, cream of tartar, lemon juice, uh, and butter, and cinnamon, and then you put them in the pastries and bake them. I would really love to know how that one got started. Somebody who is missing apples say, hey, if I grind up these Ritz, will I have something that tastes like apples? It'd be interesting to know what other substitutions are out there like that. The cheese cracker sounds kind of fun to try. Now, this is something my mother remembers, a popular depression cake. This is a name that's given to all kinds of different things. Depression cake or bread uh, is basically a make-do thing. You make this with whatever you have. And I've seen so many variations of this. Again, not that difference from what wacky cake in the 1970s, if you can believe it. This one here was boiled raisin cake, also known as eggless, milkless, butterless cake. Yum, right? 
Um, and yet they didn't. I have made this and it's come out like a bread and my mother loves it, no matter what it's made out of. And again, it's not the taste. She's enjoying the memory of the days when her mother would make these out of virtually nothing. I've seen variations of this one with uh, strong coffee or apple juice, shortening, dark raisins or diced pitted prunes. Uh, and many of you who've been to my programs know I make fun of prune recipes endlessly. Uh, prunes were a sweetener substitute that came out of this era that we're talking about. But then the vintage cookbooks took them too far. And you'll find them in everything from shakes to, you know, you'll find them everywhere that you wouldn't want to eat them in the vintage cookbooks. But uh, here they make a nice moisturizer in these versions of cake that people would make with anything they have. Now, I've seen versions with many spices, but those would have been expensive and not everybody would have been able to do that. So depression cake can mean a lot of different things, but it's fun to make and try if you have it. Find a version with some things that you have at the house and see what you can do. And how about refrigerator cake? I'm on the upper left is made out of graham crackers. Uh, and this is on the Solo Cakes and Filling pamphlet cookbook, which of course came out of Chicago. And it was made with double graham crackers and a one 12 ounce can each of solo nut peach apple uh, or peach apricot or pineapple fillings which have been their most popular ones and whipped cream so basically you stack the graham crackers you fill them with the solo fillings in between so like graham cracker peach filling graham cracker apricot you get the idea so you have a big stack you turn it on its side and frost the whole thing with whipped cream and then you chill for several hours and you can slice it like a cake. It actually softens some. Um, I don't know if all those flavors would work together and there are easier ways to do this. Picture on the right from 250 Delectable Desserts 1940. Nothing could be simpler for family or party dessert than a rolled cookie refrigerator cake. Uh, you know what, that actually looks kind of hard. Look at how they stack them up with frosting. Now I've done this in a version with kids with like, two big cookies and you break them in half and you stack them and slice them. And what they would do is cut them on the diagonals. You have the striations which look really pretty. Now, this is not easy to do though. I make the version in the lower left there. And yes, I did make a red, white, and blue one a few weeks ago for my, and actually because of COVID, I made a new version of it in individual cups. You think, all right, well, what if, if you're new to my programs, what it is is uh, graham crackers or vanilla wafers layered with jello pudding. And I make a version of the jello pudding that's a little bit thicker. I use a little bit less milk. And my brother calls it mushy cookie pudding, and he's in his 50s. I mean, my grandma made this, my mom liked it. It's the simplest thing, but it's a family favorite. My niece and nephew were telling me at the party a few weeks ago that uh, they fight over the leftovers. And I said, now you don't have to. I made like a beef version that was uh, ground up graham crackers in little individual clear cups layered with blue we dyed the vanilla blue and it it didn't look appetizing but it worked and then we layered it with chocolates and so like three or four layers in each cup and then my little guy put a vanilla wafer on each one and it turns out like a softened cake after it chilled overnight and then here's pasta with peas from depression era clara canucciari wrote a book, which I'm sure is still in the library, Cooking with Clara. She had a popular YouTube series until she passed away a few years ago. She grew up in Chicago, and while she was pretty young, she worked at the Hostess factory, and her family had no money, and there were quite a few of them. So when she would walk home after making these delectable desserts in the factory all day, she would have to collect weeds for the family's dinners. And she remembered stretching foods and making delicious things with close to nothing did during that era. So here's a picture of her pasta with peas and she said how most recipes they had had potatoes in them because it was filling, it was cheap, and it blended well with many different flavors. Now the recipe from this era is the bunny salad. <laughs> that one I think looks a little scary but there are some versions you can do. You've got half a pear um, and you see a lot of food disguises in the cookbooks and the pamphlets from the 1930s because they were still trying to make something from nothing. They were, you know, this is when we see the crown roast of Frankfurters uh, or things like that, you know, where people were trying to make do with what they had. You get the idea. Here's a cute bunny made with almonds and raisins and different. You can do this with different 
vegetables. It's kind of a fun way to stretch some foods. The mac and cheese. And on the right is a picture of Horn and Hard Arts, which was a New York restaurant chain that also had stores specializing in takeout. And they had, you like to press the button and you'd get these hot, fresh foods. There'd be people back there making and filling them. They were best known for their pies, but their mac and cheese was also famous. So they would have individual servings of this and people would be able to order it and take it. So they featured food behind tiny glass windows. Uh, and really the last one only closed about 15 years ago in New York. So New York and Philadelphia are the ones who most recognize this, but it was, it was a big thing to go there to eat at Horn and Hort Art. All right, we're moving on to the 40s, the age of pie and cakes. You look at this picture here, I have the Hershey Ration D bars. So M&Ms came out of World War II. They were a candy that did not melt in the hands of the soldiers. They were easy to transport. They were delicious and gave them a little boost. But before that, there were some failed attempts to get them chocolate. And look at that bar there on the right, which is saved from that era and still looks like that. That gives you an idea of how hard that was to eat and what it tasted like. So pies and cakes may have been popular at home during the 40s and 50s, but people were having to make them with rations. And so prepackaged candy where people were able to get it maybe was easier. And it was during the Spanish Civil War that Mars first encountered people eating the M&Ms. And so they took that product and ran. And we know Mars still has companies in this area. Hershey's was approached in 1937 about creating a bar for the U.S. Army emergency rations. And the soldiers at that time said they tasted little better than a boiled potato. <laughs> it was the D ration bar. Who wants to take a bite out of that? Still have their teeth. So, and what's interesting to me is that they came up with another version. They came up with a tropical version of this bar for the Vietnam War. Uh, that was a little bit more popular, but would it would have to be able to work in the high heat in the different conditions. So it had to be able to work in those kits. Now there are some programs now on cable where people eat the old war rations. There's a YouTube channel too. My husband loves watching these where they'll get their hands, they'll bid on these at auction, these unopened rations, and they'll eat them. See which ones are still good. You know, I have to believe there's better hobbies. For example, collecting these old cookbooks and talking about them. All right, here's the war ration book. Here's a sample of it. And here is some of the foods listed underneath that were rationed. We knew that there were all kinds of shortages. So they were trying to divert the agricultural harvest to the soldiers overseas. So people had to cut back on foods around here. My mother has lots of story about how people would swap points so that they would have enough materials to make a birthday cake for someone on the block different points, 48 points bought canned, bottled, or dried foods, 64 red points bought meat, fish, or uh, poultry. And you think about how people acted about the toilet paper during the pandemic. And you know, I was one of them, my sister and my friends and I were all saying, who saw toilet paper, who could get the toilet paper? Um, and people were working together to get points for different foods during this time. So this is a much bigger scale of some of the things maybe that we just experienced. And so there were ration books, but people bartered. They were intended for sole use, but people would barter and share things. Ah, oh, here's some cuisine. This is almost as good as the Hershey's Ration D bar, right? Here we have chipped beasts on toast, and I know several of you just said its real name out loud as you watched us. Um, we know it has a much cruder name. But this was made with uh, dried chipped beef, flour, milk, ground pepper, parsley. So this is an easy one to do. Um, and it's a meal stretcher. As you see, many of the meat recipes for that time were about how to stretch the meat into multiple servings. And this is the chipped beef on toast. And we're actually going to see it again in the 1950s, uh, written up in a very funny way in a cookbook. So here is your chipped beef on toast. And that actually looks better than many versions I've seen. But some of you have eaten this one recently. But then there were Victory Gardens, and that is a class of young women in the yard of their high school. They turned it into a garden. That is the girls from the James Adams High School working in Oregon, uh, Portland, Oregon, working on their 200 by 40 foot Victory Garden from 1943. 
And I got that from the University of Illinois Extension Archives. So as a result of the combined victory garden efforts where everybody was turning their lawns into gardens, three million new garden plots were planted in 1917 and more than 5.2 million were cultivated in 1918. So that was World War I. During World War II, there were 20 million victory gardens. By 1944, victory gardens were responsible for producing 40% of all vegetables grown in the United States. That's wild to think about that. Now, I know a lot of people who planted gardens during the pandemic. My seventh grader is big in gardens, so happily we get fresh tomatoes every year and we divide them up among our friends and people who like them. But in this era, everybody was doing it. It was pitching in for the war effort. There were rooftop gardens like this one, the whole school grounds. The U.S. government printed recipe booklets like the one on the right describing how to prepare homegrown vegetables to make nutritional and tasty meals. Now, some of them came up with some things that were a stretch that I wouldn't have wanted to eat. As you can imagine, they were trying to get really creative, and I found a recipe for carrot fudge. This is probably not one that you want to try, and it's definitely not in your packets. The ingredients are carrots, gelatin, and orange essence. Not really sure what that is or where we'd get it, and I don't want to. So the directions were finally grate carrots and cook four tablespoons, pour in just enough water to cover for 10 minutes, add flavoring with orange essence, grated orange rind, rind or orange squash cordial, oh boy. Melt a leaf of gelatin, add gelatin to mixture, cook quickly, spoon into a pan, leave to set. Okay, that is not fudge, I'm sorry. No, although I'm all for helping efforts in growing food, I don't want to eat that. I don't know, would you rather have that or a, a ration D bar? That is, that would be a hard thing to decide. All right, so canning was extremely popular and it was promoted as being patriotic to grow and can. Um, and so people were substitute, you know, supplementing their points with the canning. I love the cartoon how-tos of the do's and don'ts of canning. It's obviously it was dangerous. You could, you don't do it right, then you have food that spoils and people get poisoned. So the Of Course I Can poster was created by the U.S. War Food Administration in 1944 as part of the Nationwide Victory Garden Program. Eating for Victory, Food Rationing and the Politics of Domesticity is a book by a woman named Amy Bentley, and it talks about how people responded to the need. So 64% of women canned food for household use. Some of the things they did is they had community canning centers where people could get the right equipment to seal them off properly, um, like pressure canners to make sure that uh, the germs are killed or the very large hot water baths. Things a little easier to do now at home, but still it's quite a process, right? Do canning, those of you who do it. Um, I know some people who make jam out of things in their yard, um, but this is quite an undertaking. People who can can. And of course, we can't talk about World War II foods without Spam. Um, I once took my family to the Spam Museum in Minnesota. We've also been to the Jell-O Museum. But the Spam Museum was, actually they were both delightful. I really love the Spam Museum. Uh, those of you who haven't been there and are in the Chicago area, it's worth going over there. It's in a new location. My 17-year-old says that he needs therapy because I made him go to this one, but honestly, it was a lot of fun. Um, it is true that when we got there, they showed you a movie about the history of spam, and I was the only one in the room who knew all the stuff. I'd be like, yes, I know that. And the boys would be like, mom, no. But yes, they take you through the whole history, and the history of spam is kind of fascinating. They had a, a bugle group. They had a girls entertainment group known as the Hormel Girls that promoted the spam. And in some ways, spam is responsible for feeding the world during World War II. People needed it. Um, and many times, um, I have many folks in my programs who have fond memories of spam. And it's not that we like the taste of it, it's that they fondly remember the things people were able to do with it. Uh, or that they, you know, creative ways that maybe grandparents cooked it, or different things. So I've listed the things that are in the spam on the left. I just have too many quotation marks there, but uh, this is some of the ingredients that are listed. That does sound delicious, doesn't it? And if you look on the right, there it is coming out of the can. 
They still have spam cooking contests on their website. Uh, so from 1947, the, oh wait, no, 1937, Hormel Foods introduces spam. Um, and there was <laughs> a prize for naming it. More than 100 million pounds of spam were shipped to the Allied troops during World War II. In 1947, the Hormel girls performed across America. Uh, and one of the things that is, nobody liked gray meat. Uh, well, no, but also nobody maybe likes it out of the can. Um, but uh, different advertising campaigns. And you will find on their website some of the, you'll find like spam sushi and all kinds of fun recipes that you can't believe people make. Um, I've had, I once posted a recipe on my blog for spam pancakes um, that I, it was a toss up on the comments between people who were appalled and people who enjoyed them. Oh, I, I, we didn't talk about the recipes there. Look in the lower right of the ground up spam lunch. Wow. I know a lot of people like it. Okay. Here's wheat checks. Turn and this was a photo from eBay where somebody was cleaning out a house and they found an original box of the 1955 <laughs> party mix, which became known as Chex Mix. Um, so Chex cereal has been around since 1888 from Ralston Purina. By 1952, recipes for Chex party mix appeared on the boxes of Chex cereal. Um, but it wasn't until 1985 that we got the pre-packaged ones that we can get now in the store. And I usually serve that at my ship. That is one thing I miss on doing this virtually. Um, so the wife of a Ralston executive in St. Louis served the snack at a holiday function. And I noticed they served it in a fancy glass there. And I find it on the uh, cookbooks in these fancy glasses that it was like an elegant thing to serve the Chex Mix. I mean, how many of you have honestly eaten it out of the bag? <laughs> That's maybe a version of the way people eat it now. Here we have five minute fudge, which happily is not made out of carrots and gelatin, like that victory fudge. And we have a photo of the teen time cooking pamphlet. Now I have discussed this before, before, after World War II, it was the first time in America and around the world that people were marketing to teenagers. There really weren't teenagers before them, they were kids and then they were adults, right? They worked. They had to go through some terrible things in the decades previous to that. But now we have some teens and maybe now they have jobs and some spending money and they're able to stay all the way through high school and into college. So now we have all, there's some specific teen cookbooks and sewing books and Teen Time Carnation from 1959 is one of the all time favorites in my collection. And we can see the description of nothing doing this weekend. Well, it happens sometimes, but instead of being a sad Susie, why not get the girls together one of them may have a brother or a cousin who's dying to meet someone new. Um, and they suggest that she make fudge. Now before this time, fudge was a long elaborate process where you have to stand there with the candy thermometer and it has to get to a right stage and you have to keep stirring it. And all of a sudden you can use carnation condensed milk and, or evaporated milk and you can use marshmallow fluff and fudge is a lot easier. Um, so that you see it suggested a lot and you'll find it in every church cookbook from that era and on the five minute fudge, the never fail fudge, and people have lots of variations on it. Now the type of fudge that you might pay $12 a pound or more in like the Dells or um, different spots in the area like Long Grove is made in the old fashioned way where they whip it and they use the candy thermometers to get to certain stages. That's how my grandma made it, but a lot of people make it uh, with the marshmallow fluff and it's, it's delicious. Here's another photo from our, the teen time. And it said, next time you're a guest, remember your own party. Look at these gorgeous dresses they're wearing. Okay, my son has seen your pictures tomorrow um, that a friend is taking for us. And the argument to have him put on a dress shirt was like, I don't even wanna discuss. And here, these guys are throwing on these gorgeous chiffon dresses and a whole suit for a dinner party. Um, and it says, the hostess has gone to a great deal of time and effort to make the evening enjoyable. Do your part by appearing at your most attractive and pleasant self. <laughs> When's the last time you've dressed up at all? I mean, think about the pandemic. I'm not even going to describe what I'm wearing now. It's not, it's not a pretty chiffon gown, I can tell you that. So it's just when they're all dressed up in these beautiful clothes that the person should make 
supper on a bread slice. Now this is going to be familiar. Uh, it says four 12 ounce cans of luncheon meat. All right, I think we know that no good recipe is starting with that ingredient. Uh, two tablespoons of prepared horseradish, chopped green pepper, of course you need your can of carnation evaporated milk, and two pounds of Velveeta. <laughs> Velveeta's like its own food group in the vintage cookbooks. There's a Velveeta fudge too, but I'm not going to scare you with that one. So it says shred the luncheon meat into a large bowl. Wow. Blend in the other things, split each loaf of bread, and then you put it on there and you broil it and you crisscross cheese stiffs over the top of the sandwich. What is another name for supper on a bread slice? Yeah, we saw it during World War II, didn't we? And I'm not going to say what the other name for it is, but I would not eat it in a gorgeous chiffon gown. So as we move on into the 50s, there are casseroles and barbecue and what I like to call suburban cuisine becomes very popular. And you will see this a lot in the church and community cookbooks too. On the left, and I know it's hard to see, from the 1958 Good Housekeeping Casseroles pamphlet, um, this is sandwich casseroleettes. Those points are diagonals of bread slices like point up and you see this a lot like it's an elegant serving technique so a perfectly good breakfast casserole it's got like sausages it's got bread it's got milk it's got tomatoes and grated cheddar cheese uh, this sounds pretty good right but then stacking it up in the oven so that the bread is like it's a lot of work you know make your mixture serve it over toast It'd be a lot easier. Casserole on the right is kind of pretty. Even if you look harder, it's you see it's baked beans in the middle of it. And then they have something in here called a man's casserole, which is four cups of medium noodles, uh, four onions. <laughs> yeah, that's all I need to read. I don't want any man who's in my house with me now eating this, but it uses things called condensed cream of celery soup. I always say that there is not a single church cookbook out of the Midwest that doesn't have cream of mushroom or cream of celery. This is the era when that cuisine genre really came into its own. And now we have the hamburger and hot dog book. Um, is that appealing to you? We're not going to see that today. Nobody's eating uh, meat that raw on a regular basis, and certainly not in their home cooking. Um, but on the left, we see another popular trend from the 50s, which is frosted meatloaf. You'll see many things that are made to look like a cake. Uh, so it's the meatloaf, which got mashed potatoes over it. And the directions are, when the loaf is baked, pour off all the juices. Thickly frost top and sides with well-seasoned creamy mashed potatoes, sprinkle with paprika, broil until golden. Of course it does suggest Velveeta. <laughs> you know what, meatloaf and potatoes are really good. Whenever I have tried to cook some of these crazy recipes, there's all kinds of like you stick burger in the middle of a roll and it's very hard to get the meat cooked all the way. But I guess if you want your meat to look like the meat on the right, then this will work for you. And of course we have to discuss the sandwich loaf. This is from Foodorama's Party Book. Another favorite in my collection was sold with the Foodorama refrigerators. This is from 1959. This is the round version of the sandwich loaf. Um, usually I ask for hands of how many people loved and enjoyed the rectangle. So you would get your loaf of bread, only it would be cut horizontally instead of in slices. And then it would have like filling in between that would be served at like showers or retirement parties or happy events. I really think the reason so many people have fond memories of this is because it was associated with happy events. It's not like a funeral food. So, all right, here we have it. And it has curried egg filling, avocado filling and ham and celery. But most people had like chicken salad, egg salad, and then it was frosted with a big thick layer of cream cheese. My mother is dying to have me try to make this again. There's no way. And then as we move closer to the into the 60s, when Hawaii, everything Hawaiian was popular, we know that Hawaii joined the States and suddenly every cookbook wanted things that were Hawaiian. What they didn't want to do was actual research into what the food was being eaten in Hawaii. So here we have a couple of foods uh, and on the left is upside down cake with pineapple. And in the vintage cookbooks, you will see different versions of this. In 1953, 250 classic cakes, it has apple upside down, apple gingerbread, maple apple, 
cherry pecan, right? Some of these sound fantastic. But then there's one that's called fruit cobbler upside down and fruit melange with prunes and dried fruit. Okay, so not all of those sound really appetizing, but I would love to try apricot upside down. But every cookbook had something they called Hawaiian, which was pineapple or coconut thrown on top, usually. Um, they would call it tropical if it involved the macadamia nuts. It's like a code. Right, and so then on the right, this is still a popular thing because from 1974's Better Homes and Gardens, we have fish sticks Polynesian. Yes, that is supposed to be a volcano made out of the fish sticks. I love the curls of carrots, though. That actually is kind of cute. And it says this is a good use for leftover rice. No, there is no good use for leftover rice. And it's served with frozen peas and breaded fish sticks. Uh, you have to give them points for creativity. I think that's hilarious. That's one of my all-time favorite pictures in the vintage cookbooks. But we're still officially on the 50s here. And so things about soda fountains were particularly popular. You'll see a lot of recipes for how to make your really cool drinks at home and how to set up your own Sunday bars. I mean, who among us would not want to have some of those drinks on the left? So amazing, tasty drinks with, uh, I'm trying to read the description and things like baked Alaska, all kinds of fun things, but they also have like prune jellos. But cookbooks have to fill space too. So you will get a few gems, as you've probably noticed with cookbooks in your own collection, and maybe some that you wouldn't want to try. On the right is a Father's Day Sunday buffet, and you're supposed to serve all these different flavors, which in that particular picture uh, include minted pineapple sauce, chocolate marble sauce, uh, strawberry sauce, and caramel sauce. And you put them on the different three. That is a lot of work. And right now it wouldn't be cemetery. So um, things in cups, you serve the sauce and everybody sits safely apart. Those are awfully cute plates. Yeah. Let's talk about a time of cake, which is a Chicago thing for sure. So a time of cake, <laughs> was named after the atomic bomb. So popular with Chicago South Side bakeries. Um, I've seen this one still in some bakeries in Downers Grove and stuff. It is still hugely popular. And when I tell you what's in it, if you haven't had it, you'll be able to see why. So it has a layer of banana or yellow cake, a layer of chocolate, a layer of white, then one to two fresh bananas sliced, then there's sliced strawberries or cherries, and then there's a jar of hot fudge sauce. Then there's banana pudding, and vanilla pudding, and then some form of chocolate uh, pudding or whipped cream. So it's done like trifle style. So you got the three layers of cake. They each have fruit. They have some sort of pudding or cool whip. So this can get up to like 12 layers. It's amazing. I've had it. You can cut like a wafer thin slice and be very full, uh, but named atomic cake from that era and still popular. I've seen people online who are trying to get this in wedding cake form if they move to other parts of the country. Sadly, other things from the 1960s were not as delicious. And the one on the left, space food sticks. <laughs> Made in little tiny things that supposedly fit through the slot on a spaceman's helmet, uh, which cracks me up. Yeah, it said inserted into a helmet port. Um, obviously those were really not going to work out in space, but they advertised it as everybody was interested in space and the space race. We went from Hawaii into the space race. And so then they said the sales were disappointing. Yeah, surprisingly, people did not like the sticks. Right, but what was popular was Pop-Tarts, and they were smart enough to do marketing campaigns with Batman and other famous cartoon characters because who were they marketing to? people grabbing a quick breakfast on their way out the door to school in the morning. And on the right, the oatmeal cream pies came from the 60s. The McKee fa Foods founder, O.D. McKee, was trying to come up with a catchy name for their new family pack cartons of oatmeal snack cakes. And he decided to use his four-year-old granddaughter, who is pictured there, only he didn't tell her parents. <laughs> he continued to use her name and likeness in marketing. But what were the home cooks doing that was popular? I know this almost looks like the fish sticks Polynesian, but it isn't. This is the carrot orange jello. Again, this one is a rabid following from the 1960s. You will find it in a bunch of community cookbooks and in the jello cookbooks. And people have told me that um, I haven't 
I don't understand it until I've had a jello that crunches. You know, I'm going to take their word for that. That is not what I'm looking for with jello, but people love this. The grated carrots, lemon juice, it would have pineapple or pineapple bits. You see a lot of different vegetable jellos from the era. What you also see that people didn't remember fondly in the cookbooks was the meat jellos. The whole chapter in a jello uh, cookbook from that era called Keeping Fit, and it's got like rolled up luncheon meats in the jello. It's amazing. Or, and I've shown this picture to people at shows, people with uh, like deviled eggs or uh, hard boiled egg slices in the middle of their jello. I mean, what more do you want? You get all your foods in one go there. And then they had different flavors at that time period, like Italian salad jello. I have a handwritten recipe for pink surprise salad that's made with uh, jello, vinegar, salad dressing, uh, carrots, cabbage, and fine onion. It is hard to imagine that. Um, and there were other cakes with surprises. Here is the lava cake, tunnel of fudge. So Pillsbury, if you have ever entered the Pillsbury uh, Bake Off, they are usually trying to sell some product uh, and they want creative recipes to help a product sell. And this particular year down the road from them, this was 1966, was the Nordic Ware Company and they were having a hard time selling their Bundt cake pans. So they had a category in that year's Bake Off with the Bundt cake. And this actually came in second place. Everybody's like, what came in first? Nobody cares. The tunnel of fudge cake, um, which was made something, it's a chemical reaction. Before this time, people would use the electric knife and scoop out parts of their cakes and put in ice cream or whipped cream. Um, so she did this with uh, frosting powder and then was able to make these like lava cakes. And this was a woman from Texas. And so after that, the bunch cake sold very well. Uh, and you'll see this again in the 90s with lava cake. Okay, and I better move along here. I'm looking at my time. So in the 60s, we also see Bridge Club Fair, and I've got the frozen fruit salad there too, which was made into a mold. You see lots of things shaped into card suits. And I, you can still find at antique malls the different card suit shapes, like the spades or the, the hearts. Another popular one from the 60s is the salmon mousse, and here's my version of it. My mom loves this one, but not because it tastes good, it's because she remembers making it when the Irish cousins came from Ireland. Um, and here's the attempt I did one Christmas, and my brother refers to it as that fish thing that I made, um, and only she, my mom and dad ate it. Uh, and it was made with lemon jello, and I don't know what those red dots are, and I had trouble coming up with something for the eyes. My husband wouldn't let me use M&Ms. <laughs> but salmon mousse was really popular, and you'll see it in rings and suggested as a nice luncheon food. Lots of different versions. So here's Betty Crocker's Pie and Pastry Cookbook from 1968, another popular one. It was made with alcohol, and uh, you start to see the cookie crust for the first time. And in saucepans and the single girl, it is part of their man catching menu. And uh, I got a kick out of it because it has variations. And I thought, oh, great, they have one with no alcohol. No, it used a different kind. Moving into the 70s. Of course, during 76, we had a lot of celebrations of the centennials. I have a whole cookbook that is centennial um, ideas. And you see some of the other things that were sold during that era. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? Red, white, and blue shakes. And look at the bananas. That was advertised as a healthy treat in the 70s. <laughs> I guess you have two kinds of fruits there. A little bit different. All kinds of red, white, and blue themes. Lots of picnic fair. And Red Book 1976 had a great American picnic. It says watercress soup, country pate, tiny radish and cucumber sandwiches, fresh cherries and apricots, almond crisp and chilled white wine. <laughs> Sounds like a picnic for one. All right, and then we see poke cake, stripe it rich. Two ads on top are from the 70s and we can tell that because they have the brown and gold theme going. So this cake was made and you use dowel rods, you poke holes, you pour over the fruit flavor puddings, like the one in the upper left or what was more popular, the pudding ones. In the lower right, somebody made a version uh, closer to modern times for red, white, and blue flavors. Um, what I found when talking to people in my audience is that the fruit flavors were not as popular as the pudding flavors. 
And how about wacky cake? I've mentioned this a couple times leading up to this. One egg cake, one pancake. This comes up over and over during history. Uh, NPR did a, an article on this where they call it's war cake, joe cake, crazy cake. What's in a name? A cake by any other name would taste as sweet but not have this history. So you'll see this in wartime, depression era time. It's a make do cake, right? And again, we see it during the 70s. And it's supposed to be made by making the like dips in the pan that way. Mine never turned out like the one on the left, but I have had several versions of those. We're getting to see all my crazy cuisine tonight. The one on the left is dessert crepes. Crepes, again, were another huge trend of the 1970s. And while that looks terrible, it was actually delicious. Those were wrapped around bananas as chocolate and peanut butter sauce. I made that with the boys a few years ago. And crepes are very popular. Um, other things that were popular was fondue, and that is not something I made on the right. Uh, I know it looks like Pepto-Bismol. It was actually marshmallow cream, um, lemon juice. It had some alcohol in it, and banana or strawberry dippers, and it encouraged you to diet. <laughs> and then they referred to it as the pink squirrel. Well, how are you going to fill a whole cookbook about fondue? You do have to come up with some crazy things. They can't just all be cheese or meat, right? And so we also see chapters in 70s cookbooks on chafing dish cooking, which I have to say my husband won't let me try. Um, and I usually joke and say, well, he's not always home. But, you know, of course, we're all home now, so I'm not going to be trying these soon. Um, very popular, considered elegant. And here is a chafing dish cherries jubilee from that era. And I used to get reference questions um, when I was at the Schomburg Library. and People wanted to know how to make their food flaming. And so the calls would get routed to me and I would rattle off three or four ways, like you soak the raisins or you put a little cup in the middle of your cake. And people would be like, don't you have to look this up? And I'd be like, no, I just know it. <laughs> this is what have, comes from reading all these cookbooks. 1970s, we know the Watergate salad and cakes were very popular. And it was named this because this was popular dishes served at parties where people would be talking about the scandal. Just think what the names of things would be now. I don't even want to hazard a guess. Um, and so the new pistachio jello pudding was so popular, it turned into this green cake, which then would start being called Watergate cake. The salad is made from marshmallows, bananas, nuts, and covered up with fluff. Uh, and I have a recipe that says this was just like the Nixon administration. Bananas, nuts, and covered up with fluff. Wow. Commentary in the recipes. We're moving to the 80s, and I'm sorry, these are a little blurry. I always have to adjust my 1980s slides because the spokesperson for the Jell-O pudding pops can no longer be pictured on my slides, of course, and we know who that is just from the picture behind him, but I'm not showing his face. Um, I don't think I need to say more about that, but we don't find Jell-O pudding pops as much anymore. They were very popular in the 80s. And then there was Reese's Pieces. So M&M's asked to be placed in the E.T. movie, and uh, or the movie makers asked M&M's. m, &Ms. m &Ms said no. Reese's Pieces said yes. Do you think Reese's Pieces would still be around if they hadn't been in the E.T. movie? Possibly not. Might have been an experiment on their company to try to copy the uh, M&M's. And the Skittles were also invented during the 80s. And the thing about 80s mostly was over the top. So any trends that were popular suddenly became huge. So on the lower right, we have mud cake. You'll see a lot of versions of this, or mud slides. A lot of them were alcoholic, big, like calorie-laden, ice cream-laden concoctions that were quite good. On the left, we have dirt cake. This is when this was invented. These are still popular. A lot of people like them in cupcake form. Um, that wonderful combination of <laughs> gummy worms, ground up Oreos, and some sort of cupcake underneath there. And then we have the graveyard cake. Um, I actually made a version of this for my teen board when I was running the teen programs called Kitty Litter Cake. And they still talk about this, how it had Tootsie Rolls instead of those cute ghosts on there. Um, and they did not want to eat it. It was delicious. It was like a precursor to cake pops. It was mixed up. All right, so you make a nine by 13 cake, you crumble it up, you mix it with pudding, that's your base. Then Oreo cookies. Now for the kitty litter cake, I put Tootsie Rolls on top and we all know what that looked like. I also sprinkled it with graham crackers to give it that extra appealing look. And now here's the ads that we used to see for Cool Whip at Halloween with vanilla cookies. 
uh, Milano cookies. We can see why that maybe was more popular, but you know, you would think the teens would be more adventurous. So one of those teens is now grown up and I was invited to her baby shower. I told her I'm bringing kitty litter. Oh, remember that, see? Traumatizing kids for years. 1990s and beyond, all of a sudden we have the Food Network making these incredibly elaborate home dishes and cakes and making us all feel lazy from our home kitchens. But there are some trends that lasted. We certainly bought cookbooks from uh, some of the chefs. We read the challenges and some foods became very popular in the 90s. And one was frozen yogurt. It had a lot of different uh, itinerations and it seems to have come back in the last 10 years. Think about Menchie's and some of the other ones. On the left is the lava cake. Um, I recently, I, someone in my family said they wanted to make those fancy lava cakes that used to be at the restaurant. I tried telling them about Tunnel of Fudge, but as often as I go on and on about different food history, their eyes glaze over, and yet they still expect me to come up with some of these foods for occasions. But there's the lava cakes. Something that will always be popular, which shows up in every decade, is kolachkis. And once again last week, I was giving a librarian webinar and someone didn't know what kolachkis are. Um, if you're new to them, they have different names, the thumbprint cookie, the wrap cookie. Here's a photo from Betty Crocker's picture cookbook. Um, and the quote with that one is, no other nation offers anything quite like these intriguing little fruit buns from Czechoslovakia. <laughs> well, everybody offers a version of these. Um, I, there have been Kolachki festivals in our country. In the Chicago area, they're very popular. People at shows disagree on if they should be made with melted ice cream in the dough or whipped cream. I've seen cream cheese in the dough. Um, I've seen ones that are as big as pizzas. Uh, to me, there is no right version. They're all good, but it's fun to see what people's ethnicities or histories. I told you my grandma had two recipes. One was from the solo filling can that she adapted. Um, and there was another one that used two sticks of butter and two sticks of margarine. And it's just fun to see what different people will come up with. And they're all really good. I don't think I've ever met one I didn't like a kolachki. In the 1990s and onward, we see things that are mini, but not necessarily healthier. So one of the most popular uh, pans from Wilton were for the whoopie pies. And I saw cookbooks at the library were just about whoopie pies. And some of those on the left were actually cornbread with like cheese in the middle and filling space, but kind of a fun take on the whoopie pies. We still see whoopie pies in the stores. We know that cupcakes were hugely popular, suddenly from wedding cakes that were big and elaborate with fountains, we went to having cupcakes as wedding cakes, and then dessert shooters at restaurants and mini donuts. I put a recipe in your packet from the 1958 Good Housekeeping Pie Party um, for pineapple crusties, where you can take dough that you made or dough that you purchased, cut them into squares, you make a little filling, which in this case was pineapple, and you wrap it up. So like a kolachki, it's another mini dessert. The mini and sandwich uh, really become popular in the 90s. The whoopie pie actually has been around since Amish farm stands from the 1930s. Again, Nurki Moore, which is our marshmallow fluff folks, claimed that they invented the whoopie pies, but no, it's actually an Amish tradition. Um, but they do come and go in popularity, and recently they have been very popular. And then there's cake pops, and I know a few professional bakers who could make these quite well. I never have been able to. Uh, so there are these cookbooks at the library on how to make cake pops. None of mine turned out like those. You will never find a picture of mine um, where you mix up the dough and the pudding, you chill it overnight, you make them into shapes, sometimes you dip them into melted candy or fondant, decorate them, you can use like markers. Um, my youngest makes like brain cake pops that are quite good, but it takes some skill to make these, um, but it is kind of fun. And again, a trend that isn't gonna go away. And what's in taste now? Popular cooking is your Instapot. So you, I think in the future, we'll see what the next incarnation of the Instapot it is. Uh, things that can be made like in a minute, I'm not sure. <laughs> and then on the right is a photo from the 1956 Good Housekeeping Cake Book of what they considered very fancy cupcakes. And we know what very fancy cupcakes look like now and how fancy they are. I love this particular picture. I mean, look at the half and half one. You know the person got tired of decorating at that point. They're like, all right, throw this one together. But there's lots of charming ones in that picture. And most often cupcakes can be associated with a happy occasion, much like the sandwich loaf. Um, so that is my presentation on 
uh, fun foods in past decades. Uh, Christine, do we have any questions? Amy. Well, I'm checking the chat right now and I don't see anything, um, but everybody's welcome to send in questions through the chat if they have a question for Amy. Um, but uh, as we're waiting for those to come through, um, I actually have a question for you, Amy. Um, I am going to be hosting mostly just family, but in October, I'm going to be hosting a Halloween themed baby shower. Oh, um, nice. I know. I think it's like a super fun theme. Um, so I was just wondering, maybe, do you know of anything, like I could see cake pops being really cute, although like yourself, I'm not sure that I could do it. <laughs> um, but what do you, what do you suggest that I make? So you don't want to make the kitty lick litter cake, I'm assuming. <laughs> Actually, that was a good one. I thought that was really cute. I'm going to write um, that. Down. Maybe you could do the graveyard cake and like the cup form like I had to do the mushy cookie pudding because I think people are still going to be concerned with individual servings. I would do as much things that people can pick up and take away as possible rather than a cake. Yeah. Um, maybe like cupcakes with pumpkin faces on them, uh, the dirt cup things with different Halloween cute variations. There has to be a way to make those like baby decorations. Oh, I, I agree. I think there's got to be some really, or just make it like really cutesy looking yes. stuff, like cute ghost, cute, cute witch. Um, Absolutely. So we did have a comment come through uh, from Jaff. He says, or she says, um, mug cakes are a new popular food dessert. So what do you have to say about mug cake? Oh, absolutely. My 12-year-old uh, just taped a segment for the Schaumburg Library's quarantine series on how to make chocolate chip cookies in a mug. You oh. know, I think it depends on people's microwave and the recipes. For a while there, none of those would work too well. Even like the kits, I, don't, I just had didn't have good luck, but they are coming out with better recipes. So absolutely, I do want to incorporate those in the future. It's fun. You get like one serving and you just have to put a few things. Although Owen, I watched the video, Owen put in like half a bag. <laughs> one. Yes. Believe me, I didn't complain when I ate it. <laughs> okay. If it tastes good, who cares? Yep. All right. We got another uh, comment from Laura. She says, great lecture as always. Uh, carrot fudge, just no, exclamation point. <laughs> um, atomic cake for your birthday, dot, 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 yum. Yay. She says, yes, I'm a South Sider. <laughs> Laura is a professional cake baker in our area. It's the only person I know who can do like really good tasting cake pops and well decorated. But yes, I'm going to hold you to that atomic cake and I want to pick different flavors. See, I think atomic cake could work with like pumpkin spice cake or different versions of red velvet. It would be fun to figure that out. But or maybe we should make the boys make it with 12 layers. Um, the ones I've seen have like a plastic wrap around them to hold them together. Mm -hmm. Serving it is a challenge and a half, but well worth it. <laughs> hey, you know what I learned from the Great British Baking Show is those things, those layers have to be set before you take that, <laughs> that plastic off or it's else. True. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, if that's all and we don't have any more comments or questions, I just want to say thanks again, Amy. This was fantastic. We're looking forward to having you back in November for Vintage Holiday Cookies and Candy, I believe. Yes, thank you so much. This is always so much fun doing these presentations for Bloomingdale. Oh, good. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed it. Once again, I am going to send out a, a survey afterwards. So um, enjoy. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Stay safe, healthy.